judges who are here. It's old, old friends, and I want to thank the Lowe family I just met for doing this uh, lovely, lovely text. And um, I'm very, very happy to be here. I think I'm going to talk for about 20 or 30, 40, 40 minutes. I think it will be much more fun to have a Q&A with the audience as people sort of, and I want to particularly thank Mr. Fishman who just arrived. I look forward to some questions from you later in the event. Oh, subpoenas and questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, another old friend. Um, I begin usually with a series of questions when I lecture in this space. And the first is, who in the room can write an algorithm? So you notice there are three hands that have gone up. These are the three most dangerous people actually in the audience. Because in this space, they are the extraordinary value added. Uh, the next question is, you will see, who in the audience owns Bitcoins? If you ask this question in the Silicon Valley, <laughs> how many people have invested in Bitcoins? And I would have thought perhaps the U.S. attorney might have invested some Bitcoins just for political and economic purposes. <laughs> the last question I usually ask in the US Attorney of Life is, who has spent time on the dark net? Oh, you notice there was a little, who would have you know, This is, a, you know, attorney client privilege. But anyone who doesn't want to <laughs> hopefully lawfully, anyone who doesn't want to reveal it publicly, come and see me privately, we can talk about <laughs> what you're doing on the dark net, okay? But it's one of the more fascinating spaces. And really why this space is so hard is because it's the geek wonk divide. That when you want to think about cyber, the real problem becomes you need people who understand the technical side and the policy side. And we have not been actually educating or creating individuals who have both of those halves of their brains. And being able to figure out how to do policy has become what I put up here at the cyber law and policy problem. So let me begin first with the framework. So this is the Internet of Things slot. And we have it out to you so you can look at it. Harvey, you need to talk into the microphone. Oh, sorry. Okay, this is the Internet, yeah. uh, uh, Internet of Things. And when you look at it, I'm going to build up from the bottom to the top why this space has become so hard. The first is the bottom line, which are the building blocks. So the building first blocks is, when we think about this space, is the hardware. So how many of you currently are holding iPhones or personal IDs with you? Probably all of you. Do you have any idea what's in that instrument? Do you have any idea who built that instrument? Any idea how many chips are in that instrument? So this hardware problem for vulnerability has become a very serious issue because of the lack of what we call the supply chain aspect. The next element of the building blocks, if you notice, are the software. So we have the hardware and the people who do it, and then the software. Well, how many of you use Microsoft? How many of you do the patch when it's asked to go out the first Tuesday or second Tuesday of every month. I'm sure you all pass because you all are good citizens. So that means that for the previous 30 days, you have spent an extraordinary amount of money on a product that is quite vulnerable and weak and potentially dangerous. The only other people I know who do that on a regular basis are people who own and drive Jaguars. <laughs> But nonetheless, you are operating a system that's vulnerable in the software. The next part of this issue are what we affectionately refer to as carbon units. So what are carbon units? They're human beings. If you look at many of the cases brought by US attorneys around the country, they usually always have an individual, a carbon unit, that is sitting behind those boards and tapping in. Because in the end, the individuals who are benefiting from this are individuals. And many of the cases also have, which has become a major focus for many of us in the public-private sector, which is the insider threat problem. So just think of 
our friend Mr. Lanning or Mr. Snowden. These insider threats are extraordinarily uh, powerful, and I think we just had recently the notion of the Panama Papers that has just been released, and there's going to be an interesting set of speculation as who was behind that, who did it, was it a disgruntled entity or an individual at a law firm. And I will also point out that this notion of focusing on where the data is, so in our profession, increasingly law firms are extraordinarily attractive, we used to call them nuisances, because of the amount of information they have and why people would like to be able to penetrate that space. Because I've often found in negotiations, if you know exactly what the bottom line is of the adversary, as my father used to say, you don't need money on the table. So it's really helpful for people inside of threat issues that have taken place at the forefront. And then the other area is um, ISPs, Internet Service Providers. So they're usually referred to as connectors or your telecoms uh, who basically we all ride. What makes this space unique is that the figure is 80 or 90 percent of the space is actually owned by the private sector. So when we use the government, is much more used to owning its own platforms, but particularly in the military space. But in this space, you don't own your own platforms. You're riding and having to negotiate with private entities. And then the, the last area for the structure is this notion of the international system. So at the ABA, when we first, I was the chair of the National Task Force, when we had to figure out how do you carve up the space, we said, let's carve it up first with the law firm as the center of gravity, as lawyers. So we produced a lot of work about thinking about how law firms have to figure out about how to do their own security. Then the second bucket we focused on was the critical infrastructure. And when you think of the critical infrastructure, we actually, we have 16 critical infrastructures that DHS, Department of Homeland Security, is in charge of. But increasingly, the Cognoscenti, we are focusing on what do you think is the most significant, we think, critical sector of the 16? What would you think? Power companies? Energy, right? So if, have you ever been in a situation in which you've had a power failure? Just think of what happens to all your communications, all your connectivity. So we're thinking the queen bee is the power system. And in the power system, there's something referred to as the SCADA, the supervisory control and data acquisition center of these systems. And the geeks in the audience will tell you that most of our SCADA systems are very old legacy systems. <laughs> And you would be shocked at the capacity to penetrate those systems. And increasingly, you'll see in the press, the Russians have taken over a number of power plants when they were in Ukraine. And people think it was an interesting testing mechanism for them to think through how they can use these vulnerabilities for a variety of nefarious purposes. And as a result of the vulnerabilities that I sort of laid out for you, this is why when you say in this space, offense beats defense. So this has become a real issue for both the public and private sector. Um, and the government had a difficult time with the OPM penetrations. And as a footnote to the OPM, you should know the belief is that many of the penetrations and um, sort of attempts to probe the network took place during the government shutdown. That was a perfect time in which they had laid off significant numbers of individuals. And this may not shock you, but most people didn't think IT was that critical. So you only have one or two individuals monitoring the system. And it is our belief that that was probably when a foreign power decided this would be an excellent time to try to penetrate the systems. So as you walk the slide, this is sort of the base. And then when you move up the slide, it's called platforms and 
the enablers. So when you think of the way the market breaks, people think about where they are in software writers, what they understand for the platforms. Again, they use the connectivity, which is the ISPs and the interfaces. And then the issue that's come up is the 3D printer. How many of you actually do any of you have 3D printers? Again, in Silicon Valley, you ask that question, the hands shoot up. But we are talking about something that is truly transforming the manufacturing process. So in the law enforcement learns to be involved, we were concerned about could you use a 3D printer to actually print a gun made out of substance that would not be picked up in a metal detector, but would be able to be used and lethal. And then as long as you had the software to do that, you can from anywhere in the world send it over the internet, have a 3D printer, and start printing it. it is, it's transformative of what this means when you think through the consequences. And then the top is what is the applications. So this is what the lawyer should get really interested in. Whoops, we went back, okay. The applications issue is, this is the personal area of where the wearables are transforming your life. So the example would be um, the use of big data and small data. So how many of you have Fitbits or are constantly emanating what you're doing, right? Bleeding edge? So usually when you look at insurance companies and they try to do the actuary tables, they have to use gross numbers. So they take an individual who, let's say, or late 50s, male, hard driving, works out. No, 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 no. no. stop. <laughs> you know, why do you think we're talking to you? It's always about you. But the thing that would be the actuary tables are based on general numbers, right? So they were saying, you know what, if you wear your Fitbit and you actually work out, we'll be able to see your true fitness and then if you promise to do that we will then lower your insurance premiums because if you're doing all of these issues we can monitor your blood pressure and workout you are less of a risk and we're willing to pay you for that so you'd be stunned so when they told me this I said this is easy I'm going to take my fit give it to a Navy SEAL I know <laughs> and okay, we'll work out I'm going to look great and have low premium so we thought about that, Harvey, because we're going to have to do first a beta test, and we're going to watch you do the beta test. <laughs> and once we have that, then you say you're going to be working on two or three weeks, two times a week. X and that, we're going to monitor your blood pressure because we'll be able to do that. We will be able to effectively disaggregate your risk factor structure, your sort of profile, and you will then be able to be beneficiary of your goodness. How many of you would like to participate in a program like that? You see, you're a bit of, I would say, a mature crowd. <laughs> you really have a different sense of what privacy is versus if you ask the next generation how they understand privacy. So then on top of the stack is also home. This is the smart home where you'll be able to, in the future, be walking in the supermarket your iPhone will be able to tell you that you're low on milk. It will tell you how much milk you need, and it will transport that while you're going to purchase that milk. There will be constant communication between your home and what you need to do is the future. I just was in San Francisco and walked through one of the new uh, Internet of Things homes. And as soon as you walked in, the entire home started monitoring you and penetrating. And it was extraordinary what you were able to do just with a little handheld like this through the entire system table. What was happening from everywhere, like how your furnace was functioning, how efficient it was, what was going on with your current lighting system, uh, what was happening with you, the bills you had to pay for your telephones, all hooked into one little unit in which the other aspect is, which I gave you the problem of the stack, that we're saying that uh, IoT does stand for the fact that you need to have an idiot. IoT is involved in it because the amount of information we're giving that's unsecure to the system 
allowing you to monitor it in the future, is many of us are concerned about what the security aspect will be as we think through it. And then the last is the vehicles. There's been a lot, a lot of work done on the Google vehicles. And the argument is that statistically, without having carbon units behind the wheel, will be a more efficient, safer system. As you know, we always say more people are dying on our streets and highways than we lost in Vietnam on a yearly basis. But nonetheless, the concept is we're very happy about this concept, about this idea of having the safety, but our concerns are if you have one major hack into that system, just think of what the possible consequences are for either a foreign power or a, 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 an element. So we always say, so who are the, you know, who are we fearful of? And I'll only walk through vehicles and the enterprise. This is particularly famous in the healthcare area. So when my hat and my private with the firm, the number of healthcare clients we now have, trying to figure out what the appropriate way is to deal with the benefits of cyber information and also the vulnerabilities of what to do with the personal, personal information and the regulations is becoming a major both opportunity and headache for the healthcare industry. But there's no question that the C-suite is starting to focus on it quite carefully. And then um, industrial internet. Um, you notice know, there's the energy supply chain, robotics. So there's a deep commitment that the, one of the solutions to this issue is going to be artificial intelligence. That we're going to use machines on machines. And the speed that we're going to need to be able to respond is going to be much more of a techie issue and that we're going to be looking at the efficacy of the algorithms to see whether or not the decisions they made were appropriate. So if you can imagine if you're Google, they have, if you're speeding and a child jumps in front of the car and there also is a wagon load of cows coming on the left side, and on the right side is some uh, Boston Bruin fans. What is the calculation that the computer will make as who is the most beneficial and should be surviving as an ethical issue in order of which way you'll go left or right? That will be brought into an algorithm and then have to be evaluated as to whether or not you think the decision made by the machine was appropriate and then what are the possible liabilities that flow from it. So next, so that's sort of the uh, cyber framework. And then the other part of the cyber framework, at another level to think about it is, how we understand the governance structure. So this governance structure, as you walk the diagram, lays out why we've had such difficulty in trying to establish international norms. So at the center of the diagram are the international policy standards, international policy standards of the geeks. The technical people who basically are trying to understand how to make the system work internationally. And then you walk about who has interests and our stakeholders, as they say, in the space. So let's begin first with the intelligence community. So how does the intelligence community understand what it needs to do for collection? And what are the rules that govern collection? So uh, for international lawyers, is espionage not allowed in the international law regime? What is the rule for espionage? Um, there is no hard and fast rule. It's not against international norms. Um. It's, as we say, as old as the Old Testament. If you read the Bible, you will see that we had uh, the Israelis participate in a number of what we call collection activities against their enemies. Because <laughs> we always want to know what the capability <laughs> is of our foes. Um, and we also want to know what their intent is. So we spend a lot of money in the intelligence community because why do we do that? Why are we spending the hundreds of billions of dollars that we do in the intelligence community. Because we want decisional 
comparative advantage. And if we have decisional comparative advantage, we know clearly what the capability of the foe is, and we can never collapse capability with intent. So we want to understand the intent. I always say if you go to a small island and it's an island of pygmies and you meet the chief and the chief says, we're, and the average height is about 4'2 on the island, they say, we're planning to become the dominant basketball power in the next Olympics. We say you have a great deal of intent, but we have a problem with your capability issue for height purposes. At the same token, if we know that a country is, has extraordinary amounts of capability in the, let's say, the cyber arena, let's take Canada, we know they're extremely capable, but we're not fearful of their intent that they would ever use their capabilities against our interests because they're very close to us as part of the Five Eyes in the, in the negotiations. So this cyber issue is how we get norms in that area. Then law enforcement. I think you saw that most recently with the Apple case, in which the Bureau had a particular perspective of what it viewed the norm should be, and Apple had a counter perspective. So in that world, how I go through that, and maybe people will be interested to talk about that case, is the ultimate debate that's going on in this space is who do you think is sovereign? Do you think the product is sovereign? Or do you think the state has sovereignty in order to get access to information it believes it has a lawful right to under its domestic laws of due process? So the example I gave I was recently with a group of um, Bill staffers uh, in Facebook. We were getting a walk and tour and special uh, sort of access to Facebook. And one of the staffers said to me, have you noticed something extraordinary about the Facebook campus? So I don't know if any of you have been to the Facebook campus. I encourage you. And I said, yes, the first thing is that the uh, design of the main road was designed by the same people who do Disneyland. <laughs> so that there's a sense of a, a great, that Mickey's missing, but Mr. Zuckerman is there. <laughs> and there is a great deal of sense of openness and freedom and free food and a great sort of sense of fun. And a lot of flags, and the flags are Jolly Rogers and different types of flags. And the staff said to me, um, you notice there's no United States flag flying here. We just came from, the, from Washington where all of there are, are American flags <coughs> everywhere. And here there are no flags. Well, they're not actually perceived as an American company. They are a world company. They really do not, per se, see themselves as an extension of American foreign policy. They see them as an extension of their board, which is the product. So this ultimate tension is why we've had and will continue to have before we break. I assure you, other sovereigns like the Chinese or the Russians, they have a very strong sense of their sovereignty. So the Russians recently passed legislation that if you want to have data on Russian citizens, that data must be held geographically in data centers in Russia. So the notion of, well, what does that mean for the internet? So one way to think about it is, is that the internet is going through on these types of questions, a possibility where there will be different types of futures. What is the possibility, will we have a future that is a balkanization future? Will it be the future that we currently have with the status quo? Will there be a future in which we will not have the same sense of uh, freedom that we thought we would have in the internet? Think about the variables that will be used to help determine whether or not that takes place. And it will break on issues such as how we understand offense and defense in the system. Um, and what I mean by that I mean is when you think of the issue of offense and defense, we distinguish now under domestic law the notion of a computer network exploitation versus a computer network attack. We believe that different countries and different individuals are 
probing system and identifying them. And then once they go through identification, they will do a penetration. And after that, they may do, quote, an exploitation. Do they remove the data or not? Do they copy the data and then remove the data? And then finally, will they cause harm to the data? So each one of those questions is a whole legal regime. Each has both domestic and international legal implications. And how you break decides whether or not you are dealing with a criminal matter. Are you dealing with a what we call a Title 50 espionage matter? Or are you actually dealing with a potential projection of hostilities and act of war? Is it a Title 10 matter? And cyber and space is cut across all of our traditional statutes. And it's made it complicated for us because the one thing that lawyers need and require is lawyers are the ultimate classifiers for classification. We have to know how what, what the res, what the thing falls into. And once we know what the res or thing falls into, we know exactly then what to do. So we know if it's a civil matter, it falls into this area of understanding due process. If it's a criminal matter, it falls into this area. If it's dealing with espionage, it falls into these rules. We used to say that the key difference between the FBI and the CIA is that the FBI, we believe deeply in the law, but found rules to be a little bit more flexible. <laughs> Whereas the agency, what we found was rules were really, really important. But who cared about laws? Because we were breaking laws every day in foreign jurisdictions. <laughs> so that mindset is rather significant about how you classify the issue. And then under the Title 10 law of armed conflict, we have to know what is the projection of hostilities, what is a lawful projection of force, when have you broken the law of war, and what is the consequences for the individuals involved who are wearing the cloth of the state. So I don't know if many of you recently looked at the Law of War Manual that just came out by DOD. It's about 1,700 pages. It has about 15 pages on cyber war. And the first paragraph, the third paragraph of the book explains that the, the law of cyber is extremely unsettled. <laughs> <laughs> it's unsettled law, and we're trying to figure it out. So we have a group of experts that are writing the Talon Manual. The Talon Manual is the capital of Estonia, which happens to be the most wired country in Europe. 95% of their banking is all takes place over the internet. Their president is American-born, who actually went to high school, I think, in New Jersey, where he took some rudimentary computer courses, found it really cool, and is gone, now ends up being the president, has moved the Estonians into the 21st century. Because as you know, they're on the front line with the Russians. They were had a denial of service attack that took down the system. So one of the things they did, which is what you should think about, is in order to maintain all of their government data, they have backed up their entire government database in all of their embassies around the world. The other aspect, which is for any government official or citizen, you would find astounding, and the president's extremely proud of it. Once you fill out one government form, you never have to repeat the information again. It cross-populates across their entire database. And it's all, when you, let's say, then go for your driver's license, you type your name in, it completely populates it, and then add, information is added, then becomes, could you imagine how, but I cannot tell you how many times I've had to fill out SF-86, standard form 86, for security clearances. It is a nightmare. And I've had a number of clients who have presumably said, it's the closest they've come to suicide in their life. <laughs> because the document and the electronic form constantly crashes and it doesn't save. It is a nightmare. But little Estonia has figured out how to do this. Um, so this issue, when you go around continuing, you then get the intellectual property world. Anyone in, is quite concerned in the private sector about our IP? 
Um, there's a strong resemblance between the current Chinese strike fighter and our F-35. Extraordinary resemblance. And the interesting question, which I said about classification, is we historically have said if you're stealing from us, it falls under Chu. Um, was it a criminal act? Were you H, a hacktivist, having fun? E, for espionage? Or were you doing it as an act of war? Think of those four classifications how we understand what our response is. So what the president recently has done with what is the, an executive order that is said in the cyberspace, he will now be able to use the penalties of seizing assets and bank accounts. And that has been extremely effective in our foreign policy with the Iranians. Many of us believe one of the contributing factors bringing the Iranians to the bargaining table is the fact that we had seized their assets because of the nuclear issues. So the president said, I need something when I have a cyber attack. I need something more than, I'm really upset about this. I'm going to jawbone and say to countries, you shouldn't do it, versus the option that you know, some general will always give you, we can attack and take down their space. We can go kinetic. And the president, I need something in between criminal indictments and my generals. So will I be able to start using the Treasury's power to start seizing and freezing assets? And that will get the attention of our adversaries because they will realize there are consequences for doing taking these events. And doing these actions. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, do you mean domestic assets? Like freezing their bank accounts, right? Because one of the aspects that Treasury has is the vast majority of financial transactions take place with US dollars. And because they go with US dollars, they're able to reach out at what they call name and shame. And they can use the Economic Emergency Act that they use in the UIP. And that act then gives them this power to be able to go forward. And take the assets and stop certain banks from interacting with the system if they're using and not understanding and freeze the assets of the people that we identify. So I encourage you, if you actually want some fun reading, if you actually look at the sanctions document that we have from Iran, you will be stunned by the pages and pages naming companies, individuals, and corporate entities that are sanctioned and their assets are frozen. They cannot be moved. So what the cyber is asking us to do is, is that another space in which we're going to be acting in? So then, um, then we have the trade regimes, the ITO, and then I go up to at the, the international finance institutions. And then, the, then there's the policy issues, civil rights organizations, regional organizations. So what's the civil rights? The civil rights is one of the core issues in the, this space is, do you believe in anonymity? Do you think anonymity is a fundamental right of the cyberspace? And how do you answer that question has extraordinary consequences. So there are some groups that are saying, let's take the position of Apple, we need anonymity because in certain countries there are individuals who are political dissidents and we want them to be able to participate with their dissidents. Protest keep their anonymity through their encryption, and then not be tracked down by the state. Other people say, wait a second, that same anonymity gives um, child pornographers, terrorists, um, evildoers to use a similar anonymity and be protected. Are you comfortable with that? And that's kind of this core tension that I said of the tension between who's sovereign the product for what purpose, or the state for what purpose. So then, when we move forward, uh, it's hard to see this one, but this is from uh, a guy named Bobbitt. And what Bobbitt is talking about is, when he looks at the, let's do that. Okay, when you look at the top of this, the Zoom slideshow, okay. when you look at the top of the, 
graphic, he's looking at the constitutional orders that have existed. And the constitutional orders have turned on the princely system, the kingly system, the territorial state, the nation state, nation, and the nation state. So we call this mission notions of legitimacy. What is in the form of legitimizing the state? So we've always said there's only three forms. The first form is a charismatic leader. Uh, there are a number of politicians currently today who are using that alleged charismatic appeal to try to get control of the election. But that it's, it's beyond the system. You lead because of your charisma. The other is traditional. If you, the king always has led the state, therefore that's who should be in charge of the state. And the third is what we are most familiar with, which is legal rational, which is usually elections and bureaucratic control. And he's saying when you think about that, those worlds are merging into the final one, which is the market state. So the argument would be is the form of legitimacy is the market, not the bureaucratic rational. Apple, I would put to you as saying, it's the market and our market understanding that should dominate what is the best for world order, domestically and internationally. That's quite fascinating. Um, then the next level is, well, what have been the great wars? And the great wars have traditionally been the wars that have set up for our nation state system, and they've been kinetic. Now we understand war for cyber is quite a terrifying new dimension. So do the laws of armed conflict apply to cyber war? And we in the West are arguing that it does. And a number of both Russian and Chinese countries have now said they do not think that the traditional Geneva Convention and laws of armed conflict apply. That there's a whole range of actions they can take, which the West may think are hostile acts, that they contend are legitimate acts based on their interpretation of intellectual property, their interpretation of espionage. So how many people in this room think that the OPM penetration was an act of war. So there's one person. The, the rest, they got, they got, they got <laughs> many of our stuff in this room. The DNI's position is it was great tradecraft. There's nothing wrong with espionage. That it was great tradecraft. It wasn't an act of war. Think about that. So then the next major issue is the international order. What runs the order? And there is sort of, is it going to be the nation state, which is what we currently have in the United Nations? That is the international order that provides legitimacy. How many of this group think that the United Nations is currently a very effective body inside international order? No one has raised their hands, because we're in America. If you were in Europe, there'd be a few people who think it's quite very powerful still. But I think most of us believe it is an institution or organization that is having a very difficult time dealing with a variety of problems, including cyber, and that the veto power in the Security Council has made it almost ineffective. And where are we now in this prospect? The last, uh, next slide is um, where you see it's a base of legitimacy. And then basically though, what are the, I'll, I'll jump to the last slide so we can have some discussion. What are the historic, strategic, and constitutional innovations? So I would say the, 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 the issues that marked our generation were nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons were clearly what focused our generation. That was the ultimate existential threat. And you have to decide whether or not where you break that it's going to be cyber as the next potential existential threat. So I listed the five futures. I said we could have the status quo. We could have balkanization. We may have paradise where everything works out. And we're really, it's all good. And we have really smart, intelligent people who make it out. Or we may have what's referred to as cybergeddon. A cybergeddon in which the sides decide either hacktivists or for espionage reasons 
or criminal acts that the taking down of significant cyber networks is going to be the way we move forward in the 21st century. And if you think about it, the division between the virtual world and the physical world is completely eroded. The idea of what we can do with zeros and ones to have a kinetic physical effect, when you go back to this slide, and the interconnectivity of both the base, up through the platforms, up through the applications, the ability to get into those systems and mess with them, is for many of us the thing that you do not want to happen. And the question is, how do we go forward as a group, both domestically and internationally, to try to get control? So with that, I've left a couple minutes for questions. And I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Yes, ma'am. Um, you so might say who you are, for the record. Oh, um, my name is Alyssa. I'm a student here. Okay. Um, so you mentioned the Talon Manual, yes. and um, it seems to me that, in large part, the Talon Manual is trying to fit cyber law into existing or cyber mm -hmm. warfare into in existing yes. international warfare. Right. But my concern is that the threshold for state ha attribution is really, really high. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of these now cyber incidents are not going to be considered warfare. Right. And so, you know, how do you, how do you reckon those two? So as a, as a lawyer, one of the first issues you should know is there's many people in the room who are appellate, who did a lot of work at the, as appellate law clerks in this room. So you always know the key first issue is, we're always taught, Judge Garth was emphatic about it, what's the standard review? Is it de novo? After jurisdiction. So jurisdiction, of course, after jurisdiction. Is it de novo? <laughs> so the question is, what do you think should be the standard that should be set in the cyber realm for individuals to be able to say, this is the group that did it? So when you say, and I raised the question for you, anonymity, so right now, if you're at DOD, the way we're thinking of the system is, we're all moving to the cloud. All the data will be tagged. Every piece of data will be tagged. You put in what we call your CAC card. Your CAC card identifies who you are. And when you put it into that computer, it identifies which computer it is. So now you have the three elements of identification. Now, when I then project that data from that computer of the cloud, again, it's identified and tagged. We're comfortable with that inside our world, the government. Once you start moving out into the civilian world, would you be equally as comfortable with not having that anonymity? So you probably have lost your anonymity currently when you get into a car to drive a car. It's very hard. Years ago, you might have been able to drive and not have and maintain some anonymity. But I would say increasingly, you are losing that in the public space. And the more we move to cars that are smart cars, so that it'll be your fingerprint to open the door, it'll be your voice recognition to turn on the ignition, and then whether or not there's a breathalyzer in the system to see what your alcoholic content is, would you like that or not like that? I assure you there are many insurance companies that are interested in that. So this anonymity question, and A, and then B, how certain are we and what's the standard for certainty to crack anonymity? So one of the great issues among the geeks, I can bring in two geeks, three geeks, one geek would say to you, we are much, much better at cracking anonymity. We're getting really good at it, and we believe in the next four or five years, you won't be able to do it. Then I'll have another geek who will say, no, 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 we have a new level of encryption that can encrypt the ability in a variety of ways that you won't get it. So here's a question I pose to you. Have you ever had in this debate anyone saying we should encrypt metadata? 
first of all, do you think you can encrypt metadata? So metadata is a to and from that you see in your emails, and it lays, uh, doesn't go into the content. So first is, do you think it's possible to encrypt it? So I will give you the answer of many hours of dealing with people in Cambridge and Silicon Valley. The answer is yes. Why don't we do that? Because that is not the economic model of the internet. The economic, economic model of the internet, because it's free, we've chosen to make it free, is it's being paid for by advertising and data mining of information. And the data mining of information off the metadata is how the companies are truly making their money. So when you say that, they go, wait a second, Harvey, have you lost your mind? Say, I thought you guys are committed to encryption. I thought it was anonymity. So no, 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 you don't get it. We're committed to a certain type of anonymity, but not the anonymity that we actually are based our market models on, which is the metadata. So that's the short answer. <laughs> More questions? Bless you. Well, Sir, since you Steve. invited a question about the Apple case, and you yes. linked it to the concept of sovereignty. Yes. My understanding was that the phone itself, it was a government phone, the FBI had it, they could exercise complete dominion over it, and the, they could do what they wanted to it. The problem is that if they did it too many times, the, the Apple's uh, security system would erase it, so they needed Apple's help uh, and work, the, the products of their labor to, to uh, develop a new operating system that, that got around it. Uh, how, so how does the concept of sovereignty really help in determining whether that is within uh, constitutional norms? You know? Right. So and in that case, particularly, I, well, being a former Garth clerk, I was, I'm still fascinated as how the All Writs Act of 1789 <clears throat> really speaks to this one way or the other. So first of all, I usually begin this with poses. So I usually begin with Citing the fact that you think the All Writs Act is an 18th century act and therefore old and therefore per se not applicable or quaint, how do you feel about the writ of habeas corpus? I have great affection for it. <laughs> it's sick and old, who cares about it? It's sick and old. The writ of habeas corpus, well, same vintage of the writ of All Writs Act, the habeas a little bit older, is because ultimately what you're looking at the function of the writ is the function of the writ to require the state to produce the body to stop arbitration, right? So the function of the All Writs Act is to enable the court to have its orders enforced. And it enables the, the, the court, the test usually is, uh, once you look at it, is I usually anticipate a question like that. Because there are two cases, you remember, that People are focused on the California case, but there's also the New York case, in which the All Rights Act is considered inappropriate, right? So the first test is the closeness of the relationship between the person or entity, the proposed writ is directed, and the matter over which the court has, right? So there's no dispute it's an Apple phone. There's no dispute that they have control of the matter. And if actually you look at the affidavit that was put in by Apple, I think, I may be wrong, but it's like page 22, section paragraph 5, is a actual description by the geek they got to say how hard it would be for Apple to actually perform the new code. So this is what they said, I'll put it to you, if you as a group, if you think this is um, a problem as the control. And it's the reason of the second test is the reasonableness of the burden to be imposed on the entity. Eight to 10 analysts working two to four weeks, they'd be able to write the code that would have enabled the Bureau to use multiple tests on the four digit code, which to tell you the truth, once you put it up against a supercomputer, it would take about a matter of seconds to crack it without the data on it being erased. So I put it to you, there are a number of very experienced, do you think that's overly burdensome for a multi-billion dollar corporation with tens of thousands of analysts? Okay. And then the last part, which is the issue, is the necessity of the request to aid the court's jurisdiction 
replicate the second, the statutory elements that are overlapping the statutory. So one of their arguments they made was, look, we understand the all writs, but if this is a congressional issue, that this is a part of uh, an old chestnut that Paul and I worked with and love, Kalia, the Communications Assistance Law Enforcement Act, in which the Bureau was emphatic that it needed to have access to the telecommunication entities, that when it had a lawful writ under the Fourth Amendment, it would get access to the telecommunications. Because this, don't forget, this is the difference between data in motion versus data stored. And we said we, under Kalia, the Congress said we could do that. So Apple says, first of all, we understand the all writs, the first, first and second prong you need, but there's a problem here because this is much more of a legislative issue for public policy, and Congress has not acted in it. And Apple this should not be treated as a telecommunications company. So this is why I go back to this, the merger of where we are in the Internet of Things. that Apple plays in almost every one of these spaces. Because it's basically broken down what it means to be telecommunication. So the all writs is like, who are you and what's the classification? So that's the all writs issue, right? Second issue is, as you said, it was consent was given. So once consent is given, in our world, that seems to be a very powerful <coughs> Actually, to overwash over. And then the third element, which is why I said the geek issue. So about three weeks ago, I was up at MIT doing this type of thing. And I had a smaller group. We were hammering on the technology. So the technologist said, well, Harvard, we can open up that phone. So what are you talking about? So we could, there's like three or four different ways we know how to do that. I said, well, have you told anyone? And they said, well, no one's asked us. And I said, well, geniuses. That was you? Yeah, geniuses. <laughs> that you should think about approaching the court if you believe you have technological ways. Now, whoever did that entity, a third party, who that is, the point being that I'm making is, the speculation would be the Bureau had asked their people and they said, this is the only way to do it, we cannot get into it. And then once it became more and more public, these geeks have different understandings of what the technology is and what they can do, and the geek world is very much like, as one person explained to me, is sort of like um, the, uh, in opera, you have certain individuals who dominate the space. They're known, they are the, they are the Sopranos, or they're the, uh, uh, Pavarotti was a tenor. tenor. Certain tenors, they get first choice. And once they decide what they want to do, all the other tenors will get right. But everyone knows who the best tenor is. I put it to you, there's a handful of technologists, maybe a guy like Dan Gear is one. There are a handful whose their expertise, their ability is known through the system. And they say they can do things that most people do when, when you ask your IT department. They come to you and the IT person comes to you and says, have you thought of uh, rebooting? <laughs> <laughs> I can reboot. Boom, you reboot. Hey, it's working again. Hey, don't thank me. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the level of what the complexity is for network analysis turns on who the people are. And it really is different. Not all lawyers are equal. Not all technologists are equal. But in this field in particular, you're looking for certain types of people. So that, in that issue, they be, so then that became another problem because Apple had said that this, they were doing encryption that couldn't be broken. Really? Who's uh, back up your cloud? Uh, what is your access to your cloud? Uh, what is the technology you're using for that? Are you really saying that? So now for many clients, they say, we're just going to the cloud. You go, it's like, to the cloud, to the cloud. You go, really? Well, where's the data being stored? Which country is it being stored? What exactly are the applications this particular cloud company and server you're using? Do you know that how much off-the-shelf coding is there? Is some of the coding that's been there have zero-day problems? So a zero-day problem is a, the problem in the code that no one knows until someone actually sees it and exploits it. So now we have bounder bugs, bug bounties. So bug bounties, these certain companies are, are giving $100,000 to people who 
find the zero defect, and are willing to sell it to the company. So on the dark net, you can purchase things. So this will not shock you that uh, part of the Sony attack was a drop-down uh, menu. Some very clever uh, individual created a series of commands that allowed you to go into different systems and drop it down, scan all the portals, walk away, come back, find out which portals were vulnerable and not been protected, and then go into that portal and then start giving code. So the other element of this is that these applications at the top are now millions and millions of lines of code. So guess what the average length of malicious code is? And it's remained constant over the last 15 or 20 years. The average length of malicious code is about 150 lines. So as one young uh, Marine explained to me is, that's great, because you know, a Marine loves a country with a gigantic coastline. Because it's very hard to defend and you can, put, you can penetrate anywhere. So if you bury malicious code into millions and millions of lines, finding it is a really interesting problem because we've allowed the marketplace to take place in cyber that security is not the first criteria. It's getting the market with an app that works. And that was the natural. Yes, sir. So um, on, your, on your Apple discussion, um, first, as Judd just reminded me, the government agreed to compensate Apple Absolutely. Paid analysts working for Absolutely. three or four weeks. It wouldn't have cost them a right. penny. Um, but I disagree a little bit with your um, your dichotomy between the government is sovereign and the product is sovereign. Okay. I actually think of it more as the government is sovereign or the company as sovereign. And it sort of um, relates a little bit to your description of Facebook as having no national flag. The question is who's going to set policy? Is it going to be the government, which admittedly is slow, not enormously talented at reaching policy decisions in a way that will actually get us to a place where we need to be quickly. Or Apple, where's the default? And basically what Apple effectively has said is, we're going to set the encryption policy that will bind the government. It will, it will constrict the government's ability to, to get to the information that belongs to the terrorists, to crack the phone that will enable us to find the kidnapped baby in the storage locker. I mean, it's one thing in this particular case, I've everybody thought the national Security would be the compelling argument, the compelling case that would sort of gin up public attention and, and kind of get everybody to rally to the government side. Turns out the dead terrorist was ter terrorist was not as sympathetic as the case I think ultimately will be when you've got a baby that is in a storage locker or a kid who's been kidnapped or something like that that will actually sort of bring it home to most people. But the problem is that we basically let Apple decide what the default encryption standard would be and what the government's access will be instead of having the government do it. So, so we're, it's not the product that's sovereign. It's so we're a non-violent agreement. And I'll explain to you why it's an interesting distinction, but it may evaporate with the, with the, with the hypothesis. So app, what everyone is fighting for, and we just were talking about this recently, is you want to be the platform that people are using. That's how you dominate the space. So most of you probably use Google. Or you use Safari. Those, now, when I first started this world, we had a variety of search engines. There were many, many search engines. But over time, people gravitated to that one platform. The same way people gravitated to the Microsoft platform for most of you who do your systems, your, your operating system for work. I remember being at the court, and the big fight was going to be, should we use uh, Microsoft or the other legal group that always loved this other software program? That the two law firms loved it. And then, and then we said, look, Microsoft's going to dominate, which it eventually did, and it wiped out the other bit. So your question is, you're focusing on Apple, but think about this. Once people begin to understand this issue, let's say you're a one product company, and that one product is you start making unbelievable encryption, or you have that one site that does that. So then it's to me, it's the, the product plus the company. But really, what, as you're saying, is who's allowing the rules of the road in that area of responsibility to set what the rule is? And the encryption issue brings it all to a head. And it's like, is that encrypted product? Because there could be like X number of companies right now that are going to put up an encrypted product. 
but you feel much more comfortable with Apple because it's a dominant platform. And because it's that platform, they're building it in as a default. Versus if it was easy to get another app on that, which was not Apple, but you could access it, put it on your phone, it would be again that product behind one company. Because some companies may just be one product. So we're in a non-violent agreement because the principle is who in the end is ultimately going to set that rule for both the citizens and your area of responsibility. The Russians, so one of the arguments which has been put forward is that the Chinese have made it very clear to certain major international corporations they need to configure their products to give them access. And they walk down the two or three areas where there's the points in which information comes into China. And they're saying, look, if you want to play given our market, are you going to play or not? And so that is where they've asserted their sovereignty. We are, that's historically not the way the Western liberal democracies have dealt with products. When confronted with different types of access. Can you think, so the example we always use the analogy what you were saying is, let's say it was a safe. You go to the safe maker and you say, look, you know how to open up the safe. You, it's your safe, your tools, you understand this or that. It's not gonna be that expensive, we'll pay for you, open up the safe. If the safe maker said, you know, we produced a product that I actually do not know how to get into the safe. You go, are you? I think the legal term is Meshugana. How is that possible? <laughs> how could you actually create something that you couldn't get into because the owner clearly at some point would lose the key, would need to come to you up and say, no, that's what we've done. So that, that's our market model. And we say, as a state, we're going to say, are we going to permit that or not? That's the fundamental issue that we're both agreeing on. Right. Because what we've done is make it warrant proof. <clears throat> Can't get a warrant. Yeah, so and, and that's and, and it's also warrant based on our due process because let's say it was warrant proof against a Russian due process. We might say, good, do we believe it or not? So that's why it gets back to the international norms. Do you allow the state to set those domestic criteria or not? Or are we going to say, no, no, there's got to be a higher authority? We've never been able to create that higher authority, except the market is saying, and the, the, the company is saying, we just did that. We don't really care what the different state positions are. This is our product, you're not going to get into it. Yes, sir? I have a general question. Uh, you know, and who are you, sir? Uh, I'm Jamil Ammar, a Syrian visiting professor at Scholar at Berkeley School. Just a few months ago, European Human Rights Court issued a very interesting sentence in Delphi versus Estonia, in which the court implied that perhaps internet intermediaries should play more, more role in monitoring the content of the internet. Mm -hmm. Just a few months later, the European Court tied up a little bit. Do you think there is a case for imposing more liability on internet service provider? And if so, is it possible to push the case more in certain area than other? For example, if we flip the Chinese model and we say Facebook in the Middle East, for example, should pay more attention. I'm not talking here about encrypted information, but for example, for using Facebook for different issues, for deciding violence, you know, communicating message. Do you think there is a case for people? It, it, it's the same question at a different speed, which is that we have a certain belief in the First Amendment. So most companies are very low to get involved with censorship. That's why I picked the ISPs as one of the core critical players, because all the data runs on them. And the question is, do they have the ability and power to look at the packets? Or someone complains something's been posted on one of their servers? And then you say, yes, well, it's all about where is the line drawing going to take place? So is one person's pornography another person's <clears throat> Italian art? And then the second issue will be this speech is highly critical of X. Should X have the ability to, there are who have libel or defamation, should you be able just to bring your own case of which one of the remedies is going to be take it down? So I thought you were also going to say about the case is that the difference between the internet and our minds, the internet never forgets. 
<laughs> so because the internet never forgets, even though you think you've taken it down, the Schrems case, are there little pockets somewhere where it exists? And when you do your search, you're going to find it. And then it all turns on our favorite word in law school, and the civil side, liability. Who, where is the liability going to lie? Who's going to pay for it? Who's going to be responsible? And who's going to be held accountable? That's why the ISPs are saying, look, you know, why, if you want us to do this, we need an short amount of insurance. Because if we do something wrong, we're going to be sued. And if we do something right, we're going to be sued, and we have to be protected. And are we doing it as a result of a private action, or are we doing it because the state has asked us to do that, which gives us a sense of identification? So the identification issue becomes the big. I'm almost at 6 I know time flies, it's been so fascinating. If you want to stay, I'm happy to stay, but I'll leave it to you, Ron, too. Is there one more, there more question questions? that anyone wants to pose? I don't want to know an Eighth Amendment by that. <laughs> <laughs> one last question? Anyone? If okay. not, you may give your finale. <laughs> well, I just, my finale is to thank all of you for coming. I've known many of you for many, many, many years. I want to thank you for taking the time to do it. I want to thank the family for having me sponsored this because it's a wonderful event. And basically, my finale is cyber is here to stay. <laughs> and we need to create a new generation of geeks, wonks. And that the law school and the computer science school and the business school is to be at the forefront of helping to create the next generation of lawyers who will end up working for Paul in the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office to expand their cyber division and work as law clerks for the judges because we need a new generation because, as they used to say in that famous film, it's plastics. <laughs> <laughs> this is cyber. Thank you so much.